Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an Muhammadan Rasulullah. Madar Rasulullah Hay ala salah Hay ala Hay ala al-falah Hay ala al-falah Allahu Akbar Allah La ilaha illallah Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah Ashhadu an la ilaha illa أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله Hay ala salam Hay ala Hay ala al-falah Hay ala al-falah Allahu Akbar Allah. 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 Allah.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعينه ونستنصره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد Congratulations uh, to you all on completing the holy month of Ramadan and Eid Mubarak to you all May Allah accept from you all your fasting, your prayers, your obedience, your kindness, your charity, and your positive example in your micro communities and in your greater community at large. This aid was a particularly somber. Aid, I think, for everyone. For those who are clued into what goes on in the Muslim world generally, most aids tend to be somber. This one in particular is more difficult to accept in a more unanimous fashion on the, on the most part. People have agreed or had agreed that maybe this Eid was not the time to show off and be so extravagant in their celebration and be mindful of the terrifying reality that exists in the world, be it in Palestine or in Sudan or in India or in China. And the list goes on and on. A few things at the start to consider. I think we all, most of us at least, saw what aid looks like for Palestinians, not just in Gaza, but also in the West Bank, but particularly in Gaza. Very difficult to listen to these children explain how they don't have money for new clothes. And in fact, the clothes that you see them wearing is essentially the same clothing that they had on when they had to leave their homes and have thus been living in camps. And rain comes and floods the camps. And so their legs and feet are full of mud that have hardened over and they don't have shoes. You have natural shoes almost. Um, made of mud and they're carrying things and taking things and doing really difficult extraordinary tasks in order to children are doing this in order to do something as basic as keep water outside of their living space for their families the number of children that they interviewed that said what what aid is there what part of this is aid we don't have aid this year we have war is what many children said, not just one. Very bitter, very bitter. If, if that doesn't bite at you, then there's something deeply wrong. Now, it wasn't just the lack of the ability to celebrate in a material sense, but we recall to the weeks leading up to the month of Ramadan, there was talks from Biden and his camp that we ought to ease, or at least tell Israel to ease up during the month of Ramadan. We don't want really bad press during this month. Perhaps we should have a six week ceasefire, slow things down, stop pushing ahead with the invasion of Rafah, show some level of 
pretend humanity at least, not only did it didn't come to fruition, they bombed all the way through the month. They starved all the way through the month. They killed at rates that are shocking. Um, and the day of Eid was no exception. One such individual and family that was on the receiving end of the bombing campaign on Eid, I mean, imagine what is the kind of gift you receive on the one of two holy days of the year, or celebratory days of the year. One of that was that of the family of Ismail Haniyeh, one of the spokesmen and the leader, or the leaders, of the resistance movement in Gaza, who of course was in Gaza for the longest time. He acted almost as an imam of the masajid or some of the masajid that were there. He tried to sort through people's disputes and difficulties. This dehumanization of figures in the resistance movement is very targeted and particular and with intention. All the film and video and talk and speech from a man like Ismail Haniya seem to suggest a deeply spiritual man, to suggest a deeply, that he is a deeply educated man and a man who genuinely has concern for the well-being of his fellow Muslims, his fellow Palestinians, and even a reasonable man a man who has spoken at length at times about talking about what peace with Israel might look like and that if Israel really is interested in peace, then they need to come and speak and act on good faith. It, quite a different narrative than what is usually pushed and suggested regarding people who are involved within the resistance movement. In fact, an interesting fact about Ismail Haniyeh. I don't know that many people know this. But he was raised by, his father was the head of a Sufi tariqah in Gaza. And he was raised within that context. Deeply spiritual man. That man, while busy, I'm sure, every single day of his life since at least October 7th, is filmed as he receives practically the worst news of his entire life. The news is that his entire generations of offspring were cut off in a single strike and they were murdered in cold blood. Several sons and amongst them their children, so his grandchildren, all murdered, gone in an instant, done, finished. And the Israeli media and those who are express their hate towards Palestinians couldn't help but mock this man in his most darkest hour and say, what a psychopath. Look at how he receives his news, the dark news of the death of his children and his grandchildren, that no one will succeed him. There will be no successors, no inheritance for him to give and pass on to the next generation. Look how he reacts. He simply says, Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless them and accept them as martyrs. And he moves on. As simple as that. The response was, this is a deeply psychotic man. And it's this type of psychotic mentality and mind frame and behavior that leads to an action, as they bill it, a barbaric action of October 7th. Which, mind you, we have no idea what the hell happened on October 7th. Let there be an investigation, and then we can talk about whether to label one as a barbarian or not. We don't know. We don't have access to what little evidence there was, was immediately taken off of the internet, and no one has access. But we do have access to the barbaric nature of the Israeli occupation forces 
it's all out there to see. So I don't hesitate in calling them barbarians. The, the evidence is clear. But if we review the evidence of October 7th, and there is acts of heinous crimes, then let us then come and mete out accountability. But only if and when Israel is prepared to also accept accountability. But until then, I will not accept their narrative on October 7th. And not from Israel. They won't be the ones who will choose what historically happened on that day. That man took the hardest moment of his life in front of a camera, knowing well that A, his enemies would be watching, that B, his friends would be watching, that C, those who he is trying to serve would be watching. And in fact, later, when they kept pushing him on it, he was silent at first. And this is the point of this khutbah, which thematically I hope to develop. He was mostly silent. He was measured. He was quiet. Even if he felt pain, you couldn't see it on his face. He resorted to calm silence. And he resorted to remembering his Lord and remembering his mission. On a personal note and experience, on the last three days of the month of Ramadan, I decided to try to limit my own speech for that time period. Just do my best to see if I can have a little bit of self-control and not engage so much on a social level and with so much speaking and to see if I can focus on mindfulness and God consciousness in the meantime. Uh, I, I chose to do that instead of, of doing a uh, seclusion, uh, as, as was often practiced by the Prophet and his companions, um, so as to not be so disruptive in my life and my family's life. During the month of Ramadan, we get used to avoiding and abstaining from eating and drinking. And it's an old conversation that many of the scholars and the mystics have brought up. And there's many a hadith that talk about trying your best not to allow for your fasting to simply be, become the source of your hunger and thirst, but that you bring something out of it as well. And so people like Imam al-Ghazali will go on and on uh, at length about the, the etiquettes of fasting and how to improve your fasting and particularly, for example, the fasting of the tongue. I noticed a great many things about myself in those three days. Uh, I wanted to talk a lot, which is strange because I always thought that I wasn't so much of a talker, but you get to know yourself a little bit more. I felt the need to talk. I felt the need to interject quite often. I felt the need to correct. It was not, somehow, it was not okay that I, I couldn't perceive the fact that if a conversation was to take place and I wasn't there to correct it, what would have happened? These urges became very apparent and were quite strange to observe directly. And I cannot even say that I was successful in controlling those urges in that three-day period. I wasn't like a monk-like in terms of not letting out any words, but the point is that I was trying to limit. I also noticed a few things. I noticed that we as a generation are not as careful as generations past regarding showing due reverence to our parents and to those who have come before us, those who are older than us and have more experience and have put in a lot of time and effort into themselves and toward sacrificing for the community. We tend to just skate past their effort and their beauty and their contributions and focus in and zero in on what we deem to be shortcomings 
and we project those shortcomings that we have onto them and blame them secretly in our hearts. We blame them for our own shortcomings. These are very bitter truths that I witnessed. And I felt quite badly about them. But that is the way of growth. You have to feel some pain. And you have to be honest. On the other side, I found it very fascinating that while trying to, there were some people that I told that I was trying to abstain from talking, and there was others that I did not. And there was others that had to be told, or else it would cause a problem for them. And there were different camps. There were people who really didn't care. There were people who they struggled not to be able to talk to me. And there were those who I could tell were judgmental, and that's okay. But on different levels, I even became aware of judgment on the level of this seems to be an innovation of sorts. Uh, so I became curious about the practice of silence as a type of fast. I did some reading, and I found in all of the modern fatwas that the modern folk were concerned with um, imitating Jews. And so they strictly forbade, forbade speaking or not or refraining from speaking. And some were strange that they said at least one, one, one must at least speak once during the day in order to make sure that a full silence wasn't met. Just very strange fatawa, but I found interesting. Um, and so I, I, I hit the books to see what does the tradition say about fasting, or about fasting from speech. And I found a lot. Maybe I'll share a few with you. This is from the Musnad of Ahmed. Simak asks Jabir ibn, ibn Samah, um, have you sat with Rasulullah? Jabir says, yes. He would observe silence for long periods and seldom laugh. His companions would mention poetry in his presence and some affairs, and he would laugh and smile at times. Interesting. There's a long bit from, uh, here's, here's Ghazali quoting one of the successors, the Tabis. He says that he who has been given silence and asceticism has been given all knowledge. Or again in the Ihyan Ulum al he says, we were told that wisdom has 10 parts and nine of them are silence. Or from Rabia uh, ibn Khuthaym, who was a pupil of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and he was one of the reporters that is listed in the Bukhari. He used to have a paper, they say of him, Rabia. He used to have a paper on which he would write every word that he uttered during the day. He would take then account of himself at night to see if what he said was to his benefit or to his detriment. Upon review, he would exclaim, alas, alas, the silent ones were saved and progressed, I add. The silent ones were saved while we still remain behind. So much wisdom just summarily thrown out with a single stroke of a pen of a fatwa. But during that time, as I was reflecting on these things, I wanted to return to the Qur'an, and I thought, what chapter of the Qur'an may provide me with some proper reflection over the concept of silence? And you probably guessed correct. I chose Surah Maryam to reflect on. My goodness, what a surah. I highly suggest that everyone return back to the tafsir, the Project Illumin tafsir session on Surat Maryam. It is profound. And not only is it profound, the amount of diligent research that went into understanding the nuances of Jewish law and the historical sources to provide the contexts necessary to understand the thematic logic 
and the kernels of moral value and treasure that is in that surah. I didn't find anything else like it as I continued to search. I had to read several tafsir to see, in fact, did anyone else do this work? And I have to say that they did not. Please review the surah. There are many um, major motifs. Clearly one of them is silence. The obvious motif not the obvious motif, but the point is that it's, it, is, it has been mentioned, that silence is one of them. Given the fact that uh, at the very beginning, the first two stories and narratives that are mentioned belong to that of the narrative of Zakaria and his son Yahya, and the narrative of Maryam and her son Isa, or Jesus. Both of these individuals, being Zakaria and Maryam, observed a fast of silence one of them, it seems, in terms of Zakaria, it seemed that it was a sign upon Zakaria that his wife would bear a child. And so it was, like it was enjoined upon him such that he could not speak. That seems to be the, the majority opinion. Uh, and he could only speak through signs. So it was not at his disposal to be able to speak. Whereas Maryam, after giving birth to Jesus, she was instructed not to speak, and at least for a day. And I found that very interesting. And I thought again to myself, with these examples in the Quran, how could it be that in the modern age, we jump and have an aggressive reaction to something that we assume is new, but is in fact very, very old? And if you return to the tafsir in Project Illumin, the Sheikh talks at length about how fasting during the time, the ancient times for the Jews included fasting from food, drink, and from speech. So, several motifs. One of them is silence. Another motif that's worth considering is what I called to myself the concept of tajdeed versus tahrib. Tajdeed, which is in, in essence means renewal, to make new again. Takhrib, which is to destroy or deconstruct, bring apart. Tajdeed and takhrib. I saw in this surah tensions between, tensions or at least a relationship between the previous generations and the generations that were to come. I saw concepts motifs of isolation and withdrawal and disassociation. I saw parents, some of them righteous and some of them not so righteous, and the relationship between parents and their righteous offspring. I saw a motif of vindication and support through those pi pious children and their successors in an attempt to redeem their parents of, or of their community, of the evil, or, or in fact, whoever is near, near and dear to one's heart, an attempt to redeem them. And I also saw, which comes up in the tafsir, but nonetheless, the motif of the push and pull between the concept of mercy from Ar-Rahman and the concept of kathalik, as such, it is. It just is this way. Several motifs. Surah Maryam is really, really densely packed. And I hope that I don't bore you, but I, I do want to jump into this because I think that it helps to reflect on this moving forward from this Ramadan in particular. In the early stage of the surah, verses 1 through 15, it zeroes in on Zechariah who seems to be a priest in the Jewish temple. And thus he is a figure of authority within a traditional institution. And this traditional institution was the representative of monotheism. So he was tasked with what? Whether he was a prophet or not, what was he tasked with? He was tasked with negotiating between the powers of tradition and pure, unadulterated, 
devotion to God and reconciling these two. And that is why it seems to me, though there is a lot of disagreement in the Tafsir, but that is why it seems to me that Zachariah was concerned that at his old age and by the fact that he had been unable to produce an heir and by the fact that despite his authority within the temple, he was unable to have produced a successor for himself. Wali. He was unable to pr produce a successor. And when he saw the other individuals who would succeed him after his death or after his demise or after his authority dried up, that the, the temple would head in a direction of deviance and that it would lose its connection with pure monotheism and it would instead rely on the powers of the institution of tradition, of establishment. And so thus his prayer was made that he be granted a successor, which was of course answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would give him a son. And naturally, Zakariya was confused and thought and said, how could it be when my wife is at an age where she cannot have children? And God answers, كذلك, because I said it's possible. An act of mercy, an initial act of mercy. SubhanAllah. So, he has this fear that his people will fall into misguidance, and he has granted a son who is named Yahya, which, of course, everyone has noticed. Yahya means that he lives or that it would live on that it would continue. But it also seems that Yahya, who was a mercy uh, not only onto his parents as he was very kind and genuine and, and um, not rebellious and was wise and loving toward his parents, was also sent by Ar-Rahman as a mercy onto the temple and to those who were monotheists at the time to try to wrestle themselves away from falling into the pitfalls of the power of the institution of tradition. But a small pause here. Zakariah was part of that institution. He was not separate from it. He was part of that institution. It seemed to me, and, and, and when Yahya was born, he spoke to that institution. He engaged that institution. He did his best to engage that institution and to help that institution to maintain a tradition of monotheism and purity. Allah here is indicating that these institutions of tradition do hold power and that they are effective. God is not God is not unaware of the sociology in which he created. He created the concept of traditional institutions, of tradition, such that human beings would be able to pass on their moral values and maintain the limits and the ethics and the etiquette of monotheism. But that does not mean that he chose to control the individual members that made up the collective of that traditional establishment. Tajdeed versus takhrib. Renewal versus destruction. Did Yahya come and just knock down all of the walls in the temple and say this place is terrible? Maybe there was a time for that and I think that there is in fact stages and that's why I mentioned at the beginning that there are stages of silence and isolation and withdrawal and disassociation but not without first making sure that you have done your due diligence. Ultimately, for his trouble, Yahya was executed by the tyrant of his time and beheaded, and it likely seems that Zakaria was witness to that. It makes me think of a father who has built a movement 
and has produced children with the intention and the thought that his children would be the bearers of the ethic and the moral value of a monotheistic tradition that is centered and based on justice and truthfulness, and to then see his successors wiped out and silenced and being forced to return to Allah in silence. The next narrative belongs to that of Maryam. Maryam, quite different than Zakaria, not an authoritative figure. In fact, she was a professional devotee. All of her time was spent in devotion. She was thrust upon the temple by her mother. Interesting that her mother would thrust her daughter into the temple. Uh, the, the narrative goes that Maryam's mother wanted to devote a son to the temple, as was commonly customary, traditional. Uh, and when she came to be a woman, she thought to herself, why should not my daughter be also a devotee? This doesn't make sense to me. Let us push back on the tradition and see what comes of it. She had a measured response. She didn't just give in to the tradition and she didn't also attack it, but she challenged it. And she challenged it by putting her child there. And her child, seeing the value, the moral value of her mother's position, joined her in that mission, the way that Yahya joined his father, Zakaria, in Zakaria's mission and devoted herself fully as if it was her idea. We know, of course, that Maryam had a very hard time in the temple. Uh, the priests there uh, ridiculed her and mocked her and, and isolated her and did anything that they possibly could to make her life miserable in order to get her to leave the temple. She was steadfast and she did not. And she instead resorted to isolation and such reliance on God such that even her food and drink was provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Interesting. Maryam's push against orthodoxy within the temple itself, within the temple itself, until it became untenable to remain. She was isolated, she was withdrawn, but she was still part of the environment in which Allah had tasked her to be in and challenge. And when it became untenable, when it was clear that the priests would not follow, would not challenge themselves and challenge their own establishment, power of establishment in the name of tradition, it was time for her to go. And she bore Jesus. And the very famous instance in which beforehand when she received her food and drink, it was given, كذلك. Again, Maryam asked, how could it be that I would have a child without a father? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, كذلك. Just because I am telling you, you will. An act of direct mercy. And again, when we go back to the tafsir, you will hear at extent that this is very a, a, an integral moment in the tafsir. That when she is giving birth to Jesus, under the shade of the palm tree, dates appear above her and she's informed or instructed that she should shake the palm tree and the dates should fall and she should find her reprieve and sustenance in this way. A two-way relationship. The first part is given by God and the second part, God is wishing and hoping for you as a devotee, a servant, to return in terms of juht and in terms of exertion. And then you will start to begin to see the full possibility of the power of Ar-Rahman and the full Rahmah that's available to you. And she is then instructed, now that she has had a child, rather than give in to having to answer to the toxic questions and allegations that she is a, an unchaste woman, she was instructed simply not to speak 
to observe a fast, to not defend herself, to not defend her honor and her dignity. A very difficult thing to ask someone to do, but not difficult for the one who is purely devoted and has full trust, full patience, full discipline, and willing to take on a challenging symbolic uh, act of submission like the act of silence, something that is so total. And she gives birth to Jesus, and she raises Isa. She raises this man to be kind to the poor, to have an extreme amount of empathy with the, the indigent and those who are ill, to be a service-oriented man. And it is he who spoke for her. Um, uh, there is a very great, um, in, in the study Qur'an, uh, Maria Dakak makes a very brilliant insight and says uh, it was Jesus who spoke for his mother and it was uh, um, Yahya that spoke for uh, Zakaria. And I thought that was a very poignant uh, insight and it's very correct and it continues, in fact, throughout the rest of, because this surah is not just limited to their two stories. There's other prophets that are mentioned. So, of course, everyone knows that the story of Jesus is ultimately that he takes on the powers of the tradition of his time, the institutions of tradition. They are the seats of power. He takes on the Roman Empire. He takes on the Jewish priestly class. And ultimately, yet again, the same outcome comes. The parent outlives the child. They raise their child with the instruments of etiquette, of kindness, of beauty, but a firm diligence towards ensuring that the sources of power maintain the dignity of monotheism by maintaining the moral structure that was instructed to the monotheists. And ultimately, he was martyred and killed. And once again, Mary is has no choice but to return to silence not out of weakness, not out of weakness, but out of trust and devotion, return to silence once again. Again, see how we start with silence, we go through stages of disassociation or withdrawal or isolation and challenging then the power. And when it becomes untenable, there is no reprieve, then you go back to withdrawal, isolation, and ultimately silence. We'll pause here and continue in the second khutbah. But please keep these motifs in mind as we continue forward, as it will help to make all of it make sense, inshallah. Aqooli qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Astajwullah wa lakum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. The surah continues, verses 41 through 50. It goes into the conversations between the Prophet Ibrahim السلام, with his father. And it's quoting Ibrahim. It's very clear that Ibrahim loves his father and is deeply concerned for his father. His father, of course, was not a monotheist. He was a polytheist. And he was deeply upset that his son had become a monotheist. And in fact, it seems that his father enjoyed uh, a level of traditional power in their uh, community, uh, the polytheistic community. And that it was a great shock that the son would do a 180 and go in the other direction and oppose his father in a theoretical, theological sense and enjoin the community towards monotheism, a great embarrassment for the father. The father was overcome with anger and disappointment in Ibrahim and shunned him and was disgusted by him and was telling him that I will stone you, I will disassoci disassociate myself from you. And Ibrahim did everything in his power to plead with his father to see reason and to see truth. And when it became clear that his life was in danger and that he no longer would be able to remain in this community and he had delivered the information, he had delivered the message as he had been enjoined to do, 
he took his leave, but only after telling his father that I will ask for your forgiveness from Ar-Rahman, who has been merciful towards me. Yet again, a really amazing relationship between father and son, between child and the one that came before him. In the previous occasions, there was the relationship between Zakaria and the institution and trying to manage. There is a relationship between Maryam and the institution and manage by recognizing the importance of those who have come before you, but also having the kind courage to oppose and challenge. And also the relationship between Yahya and his father, Jesus and his mother, the kind, merciful relationship. And that carried over in the way that they engaged the people who came before them, trying their best to relay the mercy of the message of guidance of monotheism. Not one of hate in terms of the way that Ibrahim was responding, or Azar was responding to Ibrahim, the father. So Azar is telling Ibrahim that he um, cannot deal with him anymore. And Ibrahim says, that's fine, I will take my leave. But ultimately, I pray for your forgiveness. And he moves on. And Ibrahim then becomes the father of the prophets. His line is granted the light of guidance uh, on both sides, from Ismail and Ishaq, uh, Ali Yaqub, and then, of course, all the way down, uh, you know, Al Imran, and on, and then to our Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad. Moving on to the verses of 50 through 52, there's only about 100 verses here, so we're quite close to being finished. The Prophet Moses was born to a righteous mother. Clearly, she must have been righteous as she was giving, given a wahi um, to save Moses in the time. Pharaoh, Pharaoh was killing every other year the children of the Israelites in order to do population control. And um, Moses was one of those. His brother Harun was on one of those years in which they were not killing children. And Moses was of the year that they were killing sons. And so they famously put him in the basket and he went down the Nile and then the wife of Pharaoh, Asiya, as it's reported is that she is, Asiya takes in Moses in an act of kindness. Again, Rahman begins the action of kindness and then the, in order to unlock the next series and step in the kindness the actors have to have truth and devotion and solace and silence. Musa's biological mother had to live in silence. She was forced to endure silence, the bitter reality that she could not advocate for her child. She had to let her child go. How many children have been forced to be separated from their mothers in Gaza where they are they can only afford to send the children into Egypt, but the mother remains behind. And I have watched that mother say, at least tonight, my child will get a full night's sleep, at minimum. This is a, this is a daily, subhanAllah, very bitter. Moses was raised by a amazingly pious woman, Asya, who was the wife of Pharaoh, but he was also raised in the palace. The story is quite long. Ultimately, he withdraws from Egypt, or at least from Pharaoh's palace. He has his education, he lives in isolation, and his isolation brings him close to Allah, and Allah tasks him with the very difficult challenge of going and speaking truth and ending the silence of the Israelites and of his mothers towards Pharaoh. Again, mind you, Asiya, his, his adoptive mother, also lived in silence. She had no choice but to maintain her, uh, her, her belief in a silent way or else that she would be killed or tortured. And in fact, it seems that that may have happened as well, eventually. 
The point is, Musa was given the task of speaking for the silent devotees of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Musa also struggled with something regarding silence. He had an impediment in speech. And so he asked Ar-Rahman for help in order to be uh, eloquent and to, be, to speak properly. And so again, within his family, he was given a brother who would help him in this task. Harun who would carry this burden with him. You may not be aware of it, and I'm sorry to interject this here, but sometimes things need to be said. When the Prophet ﷺ mentions to Imam Ali his position in comparison to all others, he says, you hold to me the nearness and the position that Harun held to Musa. That is a hadith that cannot be rejected. It is mutawatir across all schools of thought in all books. Uh, hadith al-Manzila, it's called. You can look it up. You hold this position. The only difference between you and Harun is that you, there is no prophets after me. But the task remains the same. The task of Zakaria or Yahya inheriting and keeping alive Zakaria's message, Isa inheriting and keeping alive Maryam's message, of all of the prophets that come from the original father of monotheism, Ibrahim, to carry the wilaya, to carry the guardianship of guarding the pure monotheism came through his line. And, and I'm not saying that as, as it has to be a, a, a genetic, biological, uh, thing, but this is a common theme that's not ignorable and in this situation again yet again the Prophet is telling his closest companion here who is a closer companion to Moses than Harun he's telling his closest companion that you have this position and your children will need to be brought up to preserve this message and it is ironic that that man and his children Hassan and Hussein would be slaughtered and murdered after doing their best to maintain the purity of the monotheistic message. Their daughters would be chained and forced to walk all the way from Iraq to Damascus, humiliated. And for all of their descendants to continue to be persecuted by the Umayyads and the Abbasids for the years and years and years to come. Until finally, orthodoxy crystallized and we all decided to accept that, yes indeed, Imam Ali has at least a position within Islam. Ultimately, he was vindicated. But to get there, his family was sacrificed over and over and over again. So Moses returned from his isolation and his withdrawal with the help of his brother and they disassociate from Pharaoh's tyranny once again. Pharaoh clearly isn't going to change his mind, but they still take the action and they approach the institution of tradition once more and they challenge it and they speak truth to it and they speak truth to it gently. Not gently as if, oh, you, please only tell me, uh, this is sometimes, I, 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 it really is maddening when people say that don't give me advice unless you're going to give it to me gently. But you really, what you're saying is, I don't want to be told the truth, so therefore I'm trying to find an ayah to throw onto you to say, you're being too mean. Sometimes being mean is important, especially when we've told this story over and over and over again. I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit loose with my language. Being mean is important, it doesn't make sense. My point is, sometimes advocating passionately is an important method in order to deliver the message uh, at, in a way that the institution of power has no choice but to take seriously. Nonetheless, Musa and Harun were so secure in their truth that their silent demeanor, their reserved demeanor, held more power than the theatrics of Pharaoh. And when it didn't work, they returned back to isolation and silence. 
<coughs> which would have been a very important thing for Musa to do, given the fact that he would then have to face, continue to face the, the tyranny of the traditional way of living that had been instilled within Bani Israel as they returned right back to idolatry, as was taught to them by the tradition of power of Musa. Oh. It's hard to ignore these themes. Again, I think back to the loss of Ismail Haniya's children and his grandchildren. And I wonder if it crossed his mind. Ya Allah, who will be my successor? But in his silence, I wonder if he'll answer his own question. It's you who must succeed. Not only him, but all of the martyrs in Gaza. It is you who must find the way to grapple with the power of the establishment of tradition. Maryam represents a phase in this revolutionary process. At the time in which the surah was revealed, and in Mecca, the Muslims, and the Prophet in particular, but the Muslims had faced severe and horrible persecution. And despite the Prophet's piety and reputation for honesty, he had been accused of being a liar. And thus he was abused verbally, physically, financially, in every way that you can possibly imagine. So the only choice that he and the Muslims had in that time was that they would apply a discipline of general silence. They were forced to endure silently while in, in a personal sense. They were not to necessarily advocate for themselves. They were there to advocate for monotheism. That was the main point especially that early on in the stage where you are still, like myself, where you are still getting used to just not constantly talking and thinking about things from your own perspective. You're focused instead on the task at hand. So you have to have the discipline of silence and trusting that God will use you if you open yourself up to be used and utilized as a tool for purifying your space by challenging that tradition, by changing and reforming tajdeed, returning Yahya, Ihya, to bring back and renew and bring again life to the tradition that was meant to preserve and protect the values of monotheism, not to deviate and pollute after the death of Jesus, there were 600 years that passed and no one was speaking for the saints and the prophets until it arrived to the time in which Muhammad came. And now their speech and their actions through the prophet's speech, through the prophet's tongue, it's Allah's speech, but through the prophet's tongue, the stories of the martyrdom and the sacrifice of Zakaria and Yahya and, Isra and, and, and Maryam and Isa, the pain of Ibrahim and losing his father and Musa are all memorialized forever, eternally in a speech that is miraculously protected. They were not silenced. They were told to wait and to be patient and to do what task was there for them to do at the moment. So I ask you, what is your relationship towards your parents? If your parent is a believing parent and a truthful parent, are you very careful about the way that you speak to them? Are you careful to revere them? Are you careful to not look down upon them, even within your own heart. But instead, are you, do you show mercy? And if your parent is not righteous, 
and has in fact been very hurtful, have you gone through the steps of trying to speak power to the institution of parenthood? That is a traditional institution, an establishment. Did you challenge it? And ultimately, when it didn't work, did you withdraw and return back to your silence and trust that you have discharged your obligation properly? The final verse in Surah Maryam ends by saying, as for those who thought that they had succeeded in the silencing of the prophetic message, sorry, the, the, the verse itself says, how many a generation before them have we destroyed? Dost thou perceive even one of them or hear from them a murmur? They have been silenced. Those generations have been silenced. But when you speak, will you choose to give voice to that of Maryam? Or will you choose to give voice to the temporal authority? Choose wisely, lest you join the ranks of the generations who chose their own destruction and are ultimately silenced. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Aqooli qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Aghfir lana wa arhamna ya Rabb. Ya Rabb, I ask you to please accept from us our fasting, our prayers, our acts of obedience, to forgive our shortcomings, to help us to come closer to you to help us to acknowledge the mercies that you have offered us and to help us to understand what it is that we need to do in order to complete the cycle of mercy and take partnership in this effort. I ask you to free the people of Palestine, to help the people of Sudan, to help the people in Congo, all of the people that are oppressed all across the world Help them, relieve them from their pain, feed them, give them security that they deserve, that we all deserve, and help us in taking partnership and accountability and seeing that through as a vehicle of your beauty and your mercy. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa aqimu salah.